advertising is based on fixed principles and is reasonably exact, it has attained the status of a science. The time has come when advertising has, in some cases, reached the status of a science. It is based on fixed principles and is reasonably exact. The causes and effects have been analyzed until they are well understood. The correct method of procedure has been proven and established. We know what is most effective, and we act on basic laws. Advertising, once a gamble, has thus become, under able direction, one of the safest business ventures. Certainly, no other enterprise with comparable possibilities involves so little risk. Therefore, this book deals, not with theories and opinions, but with well-proven principles and facts. It is written as a textbook for students and a safe guide for advertisers. Every statement has been weighed. The book is confined to established fundamentals. Much national advertising has long been handled by large organizations known as advertising agencies. Some of these agencies, in their hundreds of campaigns, have tested and compared the thousands of plans and ideas. The results have been watched and recorded, so no lessons have been lost. Advertising has become one of the safest business ventures. No other enterprise with comparable possibilities involves so little risk. Such agencies employ a high grade of talent. None but able and experienced men can meet the requirements in national advertising. Working in cooperation, learning from each other, and from each new undertaking, some of these men develop into masters. Individuals may come and go, but they leave their records and ideas behind them. These become a part of the organization's equipment, and a guide to all who follow. Thus, in the course of decades, such agencies become storehouses of advertising experiences, proven principles and methods. The larger agencies also come into intimate contact with experts in every department of the business. Their clients are usually dominating concerns. So they see the results of countless methods and policies. They become a clearinghouse for everything pertaining to merchandising. Nearly every selling question which arises in business is accurately answered by many experiences. Under these conditions, where they long exist, advertising and merchandising become exact sciences. Every course is charted. The compass of accurate knowledge directs the shortest, safest, cheapest course to any destination. Advertising is salesmanship, its questions should be answered by the salesman's standards. Advertising principles are the principles of salesmanship. Successes and failures in both lines are due to like causes. Thus, every advertising question should be answered by the salesman's standards. Let us emphasize that point. The only purpose of advertising is to make sales. It is profitable or unprofitable according to its actual sales. It is not for general effect. It is not to keep your name before the people. It is not primarily to aid your other salesmen. Treat it as a salesman. Force it to justify itself. Compare it with other salesmen. Figure its cost and result. Accept no excuses which good salesmen do not make. Then you will not go far wrong. The difference is only in degree. Advertising is multiplied by salesmanship. It may appeal to thousands while the salesman talks to one. It involves a corresponding cost. A salesman's mistake may cost little. An advertiser's mistake may cost a thousand times that much. Therefore you should be more cautious, more exacting. A mediocre salesman may affect a small part of your trade. Mediocre advertising affects all of your trade. Many think of advertising as ad writing. Literary qualifications have no more to do with it than oratory has with salesmanship. One must be able to express himself briefly, clearly, and convincingly, just as a salesman must. But fine writing is a distinct disadvantage. So is a unique literary style. They take attention from the subject. They reveal the hook. Any studies done that attempt to sell, if apparent, creates corresponding resistance. A mediocre salesman may affect a small part of your trade, but mediocre advertising affects all of your trade. That is so in personal salesmanship as in salesmanship in print. Fine talkers are rarely good salesmen. They inspire buyers with the fear of over-influence. They create the suspicion that an effort is made to sell them on other lines than merit. Successful salesmen are rarely good speech makers. They have few oratorical graces. They are plain and sincere men who know their customers and know their lines. The writing of headlines is one of the greatest journalistic arts. They either conceal or reveal an interest. The difference between advertising and personal salesmanship lies largely in personal contact. The salesman is there to demand attention. He cannot be ignored. The advertisement can be ignored. But the salesman wastes much of his time on prospects whom he can never hope to interest. He cannot pick them out. Advertisement is read only by interested people who, by their own volition, study what we have to say. The purpose of a headline is to pick out people you can interest. You wish to talk to someone in a crowd. So, the first thing you say is, hey there, Bill Jones, to get the right person's attention. So, it is in an advertisement. What you have will only interest certain people, and for certain reasons. You care only for those people. Then create a headline which will hail only those people. Perhaps a blind headline or some clever conceit will attract many times as many people but they may consist of mostly impossible subjects for what you have to offer. And the people you are after may never realize that the ad refers to something they may want. Headlines on ads are like headlines on news items. Nobody reads a whole newspaper. One is interested in financial news, one in political, one in society, one in cookery, one in sports, etc. There are whole pages in any newspaper which we may never scan at all. Yet other people might turn directly to those pages. 
We pick out what we wish to read by headlines, and we don't want those headlines misleading. The writing of headlines is one of the greatest journalistic arts. They either conceal or reveal an interest. Always bear these facts in mind. People are hurried. The average person worth cultivating has too much to read. They skip three-fourths of the reading matter which they pay to get. They are not going to read your business talk unless you make it worth their while and let the headline show it. People will not be bored in print. They may listen politely at a dinner table to boasts and personalities, life history, etc. But in print, they choose their own companions, their own subjects. They want to be amused or benefited. They want economy, beauty, labor savings, good things to eat and wear. There may be products that interest them more than anything else in the magazine. But they will never know it unless the headline or picture tells them. It is not uncommon for a change in headlines to multiply returns from five or ten times over. So, we compare headlines until we know what sort of appeal pays best. That differs in every line, of course. On a soap, for instance, the headline, keep clean, might attract a very small percent age. It is too commonplace. So might the headline, no animal fat. People may not care much about that. The headline, it floats, might prove interesting. But a headline referring to beauty or complexion might attract many times as many. This is enough to suggest the importance of headlines. Anyone who keys ads will be amazed at the difference. The appeals we like best will rarely prove best because we do not know enough people to average up their desires. So, we learn on each line by experiment. Advertising has fixed principles. You are presenting an ad to millions. Among them is a percent age, small or large, whom you hope to interest. Go after that percent age and try to strike the chord that responds. If you are advertising corsets, men and children don't interest you. If you are advertising cigars, you have no use for non-smokers. Razors won't attract women. Blush will not interest men. Don't think that those millions will read your ads to find out if your product interests. They will decide at a glance, by your headline or your pictures. Address the people you seek, and them only. The competent advertising man must understand psychology. The more he knows about it, the better. He must learn that certain effects lead to certain reactions, and use that knowledge to increase results and avoid mistakes. Human nature is perpetual. In most respects, it is the same today as in the time of Caesar. So, the principles of psychology are fixed and enduring. You will never need to unlearn what you learn about them. We learn, for instance, that curiosity is one of the strongest human incentives. We employ it whenever we can. We learn that cheapness is not a strong appeal. Americans are extravagant. They want bargains but not cheapness. They want to feel that they can afford to eat and have and wear the best. Treat them as if they could not, and they resent your attitude. People judge largely by price. They are not experts. In the British National Gallery is a painting which is announced in a catalog to have cost $750,000. Most people at first pass it by at a glance. Then later, they get farther on in the catalog and learn what the painting cost. They return then and surround it. Many articles are sold under guarantee. So commonly sold that guarantees have ceased to be impressive. But one concern made a fortune by offering a dealer's signed warrant. The dealer to whom one paid his money agreed in writing to pay it back if asked. Instead of a faraway stranger, a neighbor gave the warrant. The results have led many to try that plan, and it has always proved effective. Many have advertised, try it for a week. If you don't like it, we'll return your money. Then someone conceived the idea of sending goods without any money down, and saying, pay in a week if you like them. That proved many times more impressive. One great advertising man stated the difference this way. Two men came to me, each offering me a horse. Both made equal claims. They were good horses, kind and gentle. A child could drive them. One man said, try the horse for a week. If my claims are not true, come back for your money. The other man also said, try the horse for a week. But he added, come and pay me then. I naturally bought the second man's horse. Now countless things, cigars, typewriters, washing machines, books, etc., are sent out in this way on approval. And we find that people are honest. The losses are very small. There are endless phases to psychology. Some people know them by instinct. Many of them are taught by experience. But we learn most of them from others. When we see one winning method, we note it down for use when occasion offers. These things are very important. An identical offer made in a different way may bring multiplied returns. Somewhere in the minds of business experience, we must find the best method somehow. Specific facts, when stated, have their full weight and effect. Platitudes and generalities roll off the human understanding like water from a duck. They leave no impression whatever. To say, best in the world, lowest price in existence, etc. are at best simply claiming the expected. But superlatives of that sort are usually damaging. They suggest looseness of expression, a tendency to exaggerate, a careless truth. They lead readers to discount all the statements that you make. People recognize a certain license in selling talk as they do poetry. A man may say, supreme in quality, without seeming a liar, the one may know that the other brands are equally as good. One expects a salesman to put his best foot forward and excuses some exaggeration born of enthusiasm. But just for that reason, general statements count for little. And a man inclined to superlatives must expect that his every statement will be taken with some caution. But a man who makes a specific claim is either telling the truth or a lie. People do not expect an advertiser to lie. They know that he can't lie in the best mediums. The growing respect in advertising has largely come through a growing regard for its truth. 
A definite statement is usually accepted. Actual figures are not generally discounted. Specific facts, when stated, have their full weight and effect. This is very important to consider in written or personal salesmanship. The weight of an argument may often be multiplied by making it specific. Say that a tungsten lamp gives more light than carbon, and you leave some doubt. Say it gives three and one-third times the light, and people realize that you have made tests and comparisons. A dealer may say, our prices have been reduced, without creating any marked impression. But when he says, our prices have been reduced 25%, he gets the full value of his announcement. One statement may take as much room as another, yet a definite statement may be many times as effective. The difference is vast. If a claim is worth making, make it in the most impressive way. All these effects must be studied. Salesmanship in print is very expensive. A salesman's loose talk matters little. But when you are talking to millions at enormous cost, the weight of your claims is important. If a claim is worth making, make it in the most impressive way. No generality has any weight whatever. It is like saying, how do you do? When you have no intention of inquiring about one's health. But specific claims, when made in print, are taken at their value. Bring all your good arguments to bear. Whatever claim you use to gain attention, the advertisement should tell a story reasonably complete. If you watch returns, you will find that certain claims appeal far more than others. But in usual lines, a number of claims appeal to a large percentage. Then present those claims in every ad for their effect on that percentage. Some advertisers, for the sake of brevity, present one claim at a time. Or they write a serial ad, continued in another issue. There is no greater folly. Those serials almost never connect. Your advertisement should tell a reasonably complete story. Once you get a person's attention, then it's time to accomplish all you can ever hope with him. Bring all your good arguments to bear. Cover every phase of your subject. One fact appeals to some, one to another. Omit anyone, and a certain percentage age will lose the fact which might convince. People are not apt to read successive advertisements on any single line. No more than you read a news item twice, or a story. In one reading of an advertisement, one decides for or against a proposition. And that operates against a second reading. So present to the reader, when once you get him, every important claim you have. The best advertisers do that. They learn their appealing claims by tests, by comparing results from various headlines. Gradually they accumulate a list of claims important enough to use. All those claims appear in every ad thereafter. The advertisements seem monotonous to the men who read them all. A complete story is always the same. But one must consider that the average reader is only once a reader, probably. And what you fail to tell him in that ad is something he may never know. Some advertisers go so far as to never change their ads. Single mail order ads often run year after year without diminishing returns. So with some general ads, they have perfected ads, embodying in the best way known all that one has to say. Advertisers do not expect a second reading. Their constant returns come from getting new readers. In every ad, consider only new customers. People using your product are not going to read your ads. They have already read and decided. You might advertise month after month to present users that the product they use is poison, and they would never know it. So never waste one line of your space to say something to present users, unless you can say it in your headlines. Bear in mind always that you can address an unconverted prospect. In every ad, consider only new customers. People using your product are not going to read your ads. Any reader of your ad is interested, else he would not be a reader. You are dealing with someone willing to listen. Then do your level best. That reader, if you lose him now, may never again be a reader. You are like a salesman in a busy man's office. He may have tried again and again to get an entree. He may never be admitted again. This is his one chance to get action, and he must employ it to the full. Only use pictures when they form a better selling argument than the same amount of space set in type. Pictures in advertising are very expensive. Not in the cost of good artwork alone, but in the cost of space. From one third to one half of an advertising campaign is often staked on the power of the pictures. Anything expensive must be effective, else it involves much waste. So, art in advertising is a study of paramount importance. Pictures should not be used merely because they are interesting, or to attract attention, or to decorate an ad. Ads are not written to interest, please or amuse. You are not writing to please the hoipoloi. You are writing on a serious subject, the subject of money spending. And you address a restricted minority. Use pictures only to attract those who may profit you. Use them only when they form a better selling argument than the same amount of space set in type. Pictures in many lines form a major factor. Omitting the lines where the article itself should be pictured. In some lines, like arrow collars and most in clothing advertising, pictures have proved most convincing. Not only in picturing the collar or the clothes, but in picturing men whom others envy, in surroundings which others covet. The pictures subtly suggest that these articles of apparel will aid men in those desired positions. So, with correspondence schools, theirs is traced advertising. Picturing men in high positions of taking upward steps forms a very convincing argument. So, with beauty articles, picturing beautiful women, admired and attractive, is a supreme inducement. But there is a great advantage in including a fascinated man. Women desire beauty largely because of men. Then show them using their beauty, as women do use it to gain maximum effect. Advertising pictures should not be eccentric. Don't treat your subject lightly. Use pictures only to attract those who may profit you. Use them only when they form a better selling argument than the same amount of space set in type. 
Don't lessen respect for yourself or your article by any attempt at frivolity. People do not patronize a clown. There are two things about which men should not joke. One is business, one is home. An eccentric picture may do you serious damage. One may gain attention by wearing a fool's cap, but he would ruin his selling prospects. A picture that is eccentric or unique takes attention from your subject. You cannot afford to do that. Your main appeal lies in the headline. Overshadow that, and you kill it. Don't, to gain general and useless attention, sacrifice the attention that you want. Don't lessen respect for yourself or your article by any attempt at frivolity. People do not patronize a clown. Don't be like a salesman who wears conspicuous clothes. The small percentage he appeals to are not usually good buyers. The great majority of the sane and thrifty heartily despise him. Be normal in everything you do when you're seeking confidence and conviction. Generalities cannot be applied to art. There are seeming exceptions to most statements. Each line must be studied by itself. Every project and method should be weighed and determined by a known scale of cost and result. Many things are possible in advertising, which is too costly to attempt. That is another reason why every project and method should be weighed and determined by a known scale of cost and result. Changing people's habits is very expensive. A project which involves that must be seriously considered. To sell shaving soap to the peasants of Russia, one would first need to change their beard-wearing habits. The cost would be high. Yet countless advertisers try to do things almost as impossible. Just because questions are not ably considered, and results are traced but unknown. For instance, a toothpaste advertiser may spend much space and money on educating people to brush their teeth. Tests that we know of have indicated that the cost of such converts may run from $20 to $25 each. Not only because of the difficulty but because much of the advertising goes to people already converted. Such a cost, of course, is unthinkable. One might not, in a lifetime, get it back in sales. The maker who learned these facts by tests makes no attempt to educate people on the toothbrushing habits. What cannot be done on a large scale profitably cannot be done on a small scale. So not one line in any ad is devoted to this object. This maker, who is constantly guided in everything by keying every ad, has made remarkable success. Another dentifrice maker spends a lot of money to make converts to the toothbrush. The object is commendable but altruistic. The new business he creates is shared by his rivals. He is wondering why his sales increase is in no way commensurate with his expenditure. An advertiser at one time spent much money to educate people on the use of oatmeal. The results were too small to discover. All people know of oatmeal. As food for children, it has age-old fame. Doctors have advised it for many generations. People who don't serve oatmeal are therefore difficult to start. Perhaps their objections are insurmountable. Anyway, the cost proved to be beyond all possible returns. There are many advertisers who know facts like these and concede them. They would not think of devoting a whole campaign to any such impossible object. Yet they devote a share of their space to that object. That is only the same folly on a smaller scale. It is not good business. An ad writer, to have a chance at success, must gain full information on his subject. The library of an ad agency should have books on every line that calls for research. A painstaking advertising man will often read for weeks on some problem which comes up. Perhaps in many volumes, he will find few facts to use. But someone fact may be the keystone of success. This writer has just completed an enormous amount of reading, medical and otherwise, on coffee. This is to advertise a coffee without caffeine. One scientific article out of a thousand perused gave the keynote for that campaign. It was the fact that caffeine stimulation comes two hours after drinking. So the immediate bracing effects which people seek from coffee do not come from the caffeine. Removing caffeine does not remove the kick. It does not modify coffee's delights, for caffeine is tasteless and odorless. Genius is the art of taking pains. The advertising man who spares the midnight oil will never get very far. Caffeine-free coffee has been advertised for years. People regarded it like near, beer. Only through weeks of reading did we find a way to put it in another light. To advertise a toothpaste, this writer has also read many volumes of scientific matter dry as dust. But in the middle of one volume, he found the idea which has helped make millions for that toothpaste maker. And has made this campaign one of the sensations of advertising. Genius is the art of taking pains. The advertising man who spares the midnight oil will never get very far. Before advertising a food product, 130 men were employed for weeks to interview all classes of consumers. On another line, letters were sent to 12,000 physicians. Questionnaires are often mailed to tens of thousands of men and women to get the viewpoint of consumers. A $25,000 a year man, before advertising outfits for acetylene gas, spent weeks in going from farm to farm. Another man did that on a tractor. Before advertising a shaving cream, 1,000 men were asked to state what they most desired in a shaving soap. Called on to advertise pork and beans, a canvas was made of some thousand of homes. Theretofore all pork and bean advertising has been based on, buy my brand. That canvas showed that only 4% of the people used any canned pork and beans. 96% baked their beans at home. The problem was not to sell a particular brand. Any such attempt appealed to only 4%. The right appeal was to win the people away from home-baked beans. The advertising, which without knowledge must have failed, proved a great success. In every line involving scientific details, a censor is appointed. The ad writer, however well-informed, may draw wrong inferences from facts. 
so an authority passes on every advertisement. The uninformed would be staggered to know the amount of work involved in a single ad. Weeks of work sometimes. The ad seems so simple, and it must be simple to appeal to simple people. But back of that ad may lie reams of data, volumes of information, months of research. So this is no lazy man's field. We must have skill and knowledge, training and experience, and the right equipment. Advertising is much like war, minus the venom. Or much, if you prefer, like a game of chess. We are usually out to capture others' citadels or garner others' trade. We must have skills and knowledge. We must have training and experience, also the right equipment. We must have the proper ammunition. We dare not underestimate opponents. Our intelligence department is a vital factor. We need alliances with dealers. We also need a strategy of the best sort, to multiply the value of our forces. Sometimes in new campaigns comes the question of a name. That may be the most important. Often the right name is an advertisement in itself. It may tell a fairly complete story, like shredded wheat, cream of wheat, puffed rice, spearmint gum, palmolive soap, etc. That may be a great advantage. The name is usually conspicuously displayed. Many a name has proved to be the greatest factor in an article's success. Other names prove a distinct disadvantage. Toasted cornflakes, for instance. Too many others may share demand with the man who builds it up. A high price creates resistance. It tends to limit one's field. Many coined names without meaning have succeeded. Kodak, Caro, etc. are examples. They are exclusive. The advertiser who gives them meaning never needs to share his advantage. But a significant name which helps to impress a dominant claim is certainly a good advantage. Names that tell stories have been worth millions of dollars. So a great deal of research often precedes the selection of a name. Sometimes a price must be decided. A high price creates resistance. It tends to limit one's field. The cost of getting an added profit may be more than the profit. It is a well-known fact that the greatest profits are made on great volume at a small profit. Campbell's soups, Palmolive soap, Caro syrup, and Ford cars are conspicuous examples. A price which appeals only to, say 10%, multiplies the cost of selling. But on the other hand, a high price is unimportant. High profit is essential. The line may have a small sale per customer. One hardly cares what he pays for a corn remedy because he uses little. The maker must have a large margin because of small consumption. On other lines, a higher price may even be an inducement. Such lines are judged largely by price. A product that costs more than the ordinary is considered above the ordinary. So the price question is always a very big factor in strategy. Competition must be considered. What are the forces against you? What have they in price or quality or claims to weigh against your appeal? What have you to win trade against them? What have you to hold trade against them when you get it? How strongly are your rivals entrenched? There are some fields that are almost impregnable. They are usually lines that create a new habit or custom and which typify that custom with consumers. They so dominate a field that one can hardly hope to invade it. They have volume, the profit to make a tremendous fight. Such fields are being constantly invaded. But it is done through some convincing advantage, or through very superior salesmanship in print. These are samples of the problems which advertising men must solve. These are some of the reasons why vast experience is necessary. One oversight may cost the client millions in the end. One wrong piece of strategy may prohibit success. Things done in one way may be twice as easy, half as costly, as when done another way. Advertising without this preparation is like a waterfall going to waste. The power might be there, but it is not made effective. We must center the force and direct it in a practical direction. Advertising often looks very simple. Thousands of men claim the ability to do it, and there is still a wide impression that many men can. As a result, much advertising goes by favor. But the men who know realize that the problems are as many and as important as the problems in building a skyscraper. And many of them lie in the foundations. Conclusion. Headlines on ads are like headlines on news items. Nobody reads a whole newspaper. One is interested in financial news, one in political, one in society, one in cookery, one in sports, etc. There are whole pages in any newspaper which we may never scan at all. Yet other people might turn directly to those pages. We pick out what we wish to read by headlines, and we don't want those headlines misleading. The writing of headlines is one of the greatest journalistic arts. They either conceal or reveal an interest. You are presenting an ad to millions. Among them is a percentage, small or large, whom you hope to interest. Go after that percentage and try to strike the chord that responds. If you are advertising corsets, men and children don't interest you. If you are advertising cigars, you have no use for non-smokers. Razors won't attract women. Blush will not interest men. Don't think that those millions will read your ads to find out if your product interests. They will decide at a glance, by your headline or your pictures. Address the people you seek, and them only.